the Remington Microscreen 3. You wonder why your throat is dry more and more. It's really sore. You gotta believe in every relief. You know what you're looking for? Ricola here, Ricola there, Ricola here, Ricola there, Ricola here, Ricola there, Ricola here, Ricola there. There are those who don't jump on the latest trends, who believe in a truck's agility and determination, who believe in a truck with legendary Vortec technology that handles even when fully loaded. For those who know when a truck is a truck and not just a bandwagon. Jump into your very own 98 Sonoma right now. Get $2,000 cash back or 0.9% APR financing. The Sonoma from GMC. It was the big bang of the 12th century, the invention of gunpowder. Since then, the gun has been a source of legend and lore. The showdown between Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. How the Tommy gun made it to the big screen. And the story of how a ship's steering wheel sparked the invention of the Colt revolver. Guts and Glory Sunday presents Tales of the Gun. Tomorrow at 8 Eastern, 9 Pacific, on the History Channel, where the past comes alive. In a time of missing trust, of government denials and the power of information, the cover-ups begin to unravel, the questions begin to mount, and you see the difference between what you've been told and what really happened. True stories from a world of lies. Guts and Glory Sunday presents Sworn to Secrecy. Sundays at 9 Eastern, 10 Pacific on the History Channel, where the past comes alive. There are secrets you should know. Things you should see. Questions you should ask. Then again, how much do you want to know? You got this phone tap? Break into the past, into a world of deception, into a world where reality is history undercover. Tomorrow at 10 Eastern, 11 Pacific on the History Channel. We now continue with our technological and cultural look at the history of robots. If the industrial robot has a family tree, its roots are firmly planted with this man. George Duvall is known as the grandfather of robotics. It was his patent filed in 1954 that was the blueprint for the machine that would revolutionize industry. This is the kind of a job that a man normally doesn't like to do. It's really terribly hot in those forging operations. Duvall, a prolific inventor, also responsible for the barcode and the electric door, teamed with engineer Joe Engelberger, now known as the father of robotics. Joe says it all began at a cocktail party. We got talking in a, in a corner, and I think we also got into our cups. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, uh, talking about it, I said, gee, that sounds like a very good idea. I think the patent makes sense to me. Uh, what are you doing with it? And he said, well, I'm, no one's paying any attention to me. So I said, let me have a crack at it. Let me see if I can't find the financing. And in the cold gray dawn with a hangover, it still looked like a pretty good idea. <laughs> Both men believed in the idea, but it proved difficult to convince companies to fund their project. When we built the first industrial robot to get the financing, I visited 46 different companies before I could find someone who believed it was even possible to, to do such a thing. It took years of development and fundraising, but George Duvall's blueprint lurched to robotic life in 1961. The new company was called Unimation. The robot was named Unimate. Automation's newest contribution to man. This jack-of-all-trades robot is called Unimate, and it handles dull, difficult, or dangerous jobs with equal aplomb. That same year, General Motors bought the first Unimate and put it in a New Jersey plant to take red-hot parts from a die-casting machine. Automation was not new to the automobile industry, but this was something different. The Unimate created the definition of an industrial robot. 
an industrial robot is something that has at least three degrees of freedom, which means three axes that can move independently. It has to be reprogrammable, and it has to be able to perform different tasks. And uh, that's the universally agreed definition today. The original Unimate had an awful lot of the major qualities that all industrial robots have today. It had to have a memory. It had to remember up to 100 different steps. It was 100 different things in a row it could do. He has muscle, can pick up 75 pounds, and can stand extreme heat, cold, noxious odors, toxic gases, and radiation. He never complains, asks for a promotion, or demands a pay raise. He doesn't break, bend, or burn, and should make some other Unimate a perfect husband. Or maybe wife? It was a primitive machine weighing 2,000 pounds, powered by hydraulics, with memory stored on a clunky magnetic drum. Its nervous system was operated by feedback, or servo mechanisms, which measure where the robot is in space. When it reaches its pre-programmed point, it then performs its next maneuver. Another innovation was the end effector, the robot's hand. This is the part of the machine that interfaces with its surroundings. Each is designed to do a specific job, and it allowed robots to weld, drill, spray, and grip. The end effector is another word for tooling. Now, the tooling can get pretty sophisticated because uh, some of the tooling has uh, sensors built into the clamp, let's say, that will allow it to exert just so much pressure on something. However, aside from General Motors, buyers for the new robots were scarce. If you don't understand something, and to try to get a normal businessman to understand a robot, you know, he thought you're talking about science fiction or something like that. Management was skeptical, workers fearful. Corporate executives believed the robots wouldn't work. Employees feared they would work too well and replace them. But robots mostly did the jobs people didn't want to do. And in fact, robots created jobs. Humans had to design, build, operate, and repair them. So they're able to use the kind of, of brain power that they have, like one of the people that went to one of our classes uh, learning how to program robots, came out of it and said, gee, now I can finally use my brains for this company I've been working for for 20 years instead of just my muscles. By the mid-60s, even labor unions endorsed robots, recognizing the inevitable increase in productivity. But the original Unimate, with an $18,000 price tag, remained a tough sell. What we did to get people started, we would rent the robot. You'd hire it, like a person. And we would say, at that time I said, it's so many $6 an hour, I think, for the first shift, and $3 an hour for the second shift. So your labor gets cheaper. The robot had one thing advantage immediately, and that is the robot can work three shifts or work 24 hours a day. George and Joe set out to change public perception of the new machines. So they took their robotic show on the road. All right, would you welcome Joe Engelberger? Joe! And ultimately, the, the show that was so important to us was the Johnny Carson show. And that's where the idea was, suppose we try to give the impression that the robot could do the whole show. So you had the three scenes. One, it could play better golf than Carson could. Is that wild? Two, it could do the beer commercial better than, than anybody. You see, in case you get tired and can't make it to the show someday, I, we can program the machine to do a commercial. it could lead the orchestra. Now what he's doing now is to program what he's going to have the machine do. I mean, he's putting this information into the machine. And that gave me a chance to show how the arm moved with a baton. Take it on the downbeat. 